Good morning, and welcome to St. John's Online Worship. My name is Pastor Jake Alstead, and this is a place where grace abounds. Dear friends, we have come to the end of the Epiphany season. Um, this is the last Sunday before we enter the season of Lent. And so this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And uh, I'm going to begin with some announcements about Lent here. Uh, Ash Wednesday, we are going to be online only. All right, and that's at 7 o'clock on YouTube. Uh, we'll have our Ash Wednesday service, and that will kick off a series called Oh Love, How Deep, How Broad, How High, uh, that we'll be going through um, during our, our midweek Lenten services. And those will be online at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays uh, on YouTube. All right, so looking forward to going through that series with you. It is an amazing series that explores uh, the enormous dimensions of God's love for us. Hopefully you all got the email this week or, or the letter about uh, the next couple Sundays, the next handful of Sundays, um, the, our worship schedule. This week, of course, is online only. Next Sunday, we're going to bring back 
the drive-in worship service. I got rid of my old FM transmitter, and uh, Anonymous Donor got us a new FM transmitter that hopefully will work much better. So next Sunday is drive-in worship at 10.15. If you'd like to attend, please RSVP this Thursday from 9 a.m. to noon. Call the office. Just to let me know how many people are, are coming, how many I can prepare for. The following Sunday, uh, February 28th, that's going to be in person. We're going to be back in the sanctuary that Sunday. So I'll definitely need you to RSVP for that service if you'd like to attend. Again, calling the Thursday before from 9 a.m. to noon. The following Sunday after that, March 7th, is going to be drive-in worship once again. And so, again, RSVP for that. Let me know if you plan on being there. Uh, that, that's the worship schedule for the next three Sundays. After that, Church Council is going to meet again on March 9th, that Tuesday, and I'll have more information going forward. With that, may God bless our worship today. Um, our main point today is that even though we don't see much in our world clearly, if we see Jesus clearly, we're going to be all right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice, Blessed are all those who wait for him. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept, and gladness of heart as when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We confess that we have not always brought glory to you through our words and our deeds. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We repent of all that is sinful in our lives both that which we know and those things unknown to us that are against your righteous laws. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. Upon this your confession and by the command of our Lord, I, a called and ordained servant of Christ, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless 
at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of your inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On February 14th, we commemorate Valentine, martyr. The word martyr reminds us that Valentine died for confessing his faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. For 1,800 years, Valentine's faithful witness has inspired Christian people to faith-filled words and loving deeds. A physician and priest in Rome during the rule of Emperor Claudius, Valentine lived in a time when Christians were harshly persecuted because of their religion. Arrested by Roman authorities, he received a death sentence. Tradition suggests that while Valentine was waiting in prison for his day of execution, he developed a friendship with the young daughter of his jailer. He told the girl about Jesus and shared his hope of heaven. On the day of his execution, he left her a note cut into a special shape. Written inside was a message of affection and encouragement. He signed the letter, Your Valentine, beginning a tradition that has changed and grown through the centuries. Love for Christ and love in Christ shape the actions of Valentine. On Valentine's Day, it is good to reflect on what that love is like. In the hymn, Love in Christ is Strong and Living, poet Dorothy R. Schultz helps our reflection with three beautiful stanzas set to music by her husband, Ralph C. Schultz. Together, we sing the hymn. saints of ages past, including your servant Valentine. Help us proclaim your love in our day in word and deed as we look forward to the great reunion with all of the saints in your heavenly kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for this Transfiguration Sunday is 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, 
Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. And it's divided up here for us with ones and twos. I'll invite the women to join me for the ones and the men to join me for the twos. We begin together. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes. He does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, around him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18, and chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. 
and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, during this epiphany season, we've seen Jesus revealed to us in the scriptures in, in a number of different ways. At his baptism, we liken Jesus to a sponge because he soaks up every last drop of our sin and sickness and everything that's wrong with this world and he brings it to the cross where he puts it to death in his own death. We saw Jesus as the only ladder between heaven and earth, the bridge between God and man. He is the only mediator between the two. When he called his disciples to be fishers of men, we saw him as the ultimate fisherman. He catches us. He puts our old life to death and all this through water. And he brings us out of that water to a new life as a new creation in him. And last week we saw him as our great physician who binds up our wounds by uniting us to his own. And now today on this last Sunday in Epiphany, our gospel text takes us to another Epiphany, the Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the mountain and they saw him become radiant. His face shone like the sun and his clothes were intensely white, whiter than anyone could bleach them. 
on that mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus allowed them to peek behind the curtain, if you will, just a little bit more. There they saw with their eyes that Jesus was indeed not just an ordinary man, but he was divine, and the Father's voice from heaven confirmed as much and more as he said to them, This is my beloved Son. This is God's Son, God himself. Listen to him, the Father says. And before Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples, the disciples didn't have the full picture. You know, before then, they, they were seeing in part as Jesus continued to reveal himself to them. I don't know about you, but not being able to see the full picture seems to be a pretty accurate way to describe life these days. I feel like I'm constantly asking Pontius Pilate's question, right? What is truth? Uh, social media, timelines, and, and trending topics on Twitter, and, and headlines, posts, you name it, they're all over the place. How do we know what information is true? I mean, how do we know that this particular media outlet isn't trying to get a certain reaction with the language that they're using? And it's all too common for, for people to share posts and articles out of haste and emotion rather than, than taking the time to, you know, check the, the validity of the information that's being passed along, do a little checking on that. But, you know, and I, I think this speaks to a larger problem, too, that often we don't want to see the truth. We don't want to know what's really going on. We're comfortable in our own ways and our own preconceived notions and we don't want to see or refuse to see things that would make us uncomfortable or prove us wrong. So all that some days can feel like a big cloudy mess. And that's all just the uncertainty of what's happening today. I mean, we know even less about the future, about what tomorrow brings. And we're not in control of, of what happens to us tomorrow, and so it's even harder to see clearly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, Paul writes this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Much like Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, we don't get to see the full picture. So much is happening around us, and so much is beyond our, our understanding. We don't get to have control over it either. We're searching for answers a lot of the times. We question what's true. It feels like we're in a dark room, but God doesn't leave us in the dark without a light. As he did for the disciples that day on the mountain, he gives something to us too something even better. He peels back the curtain and lets us see clearly what we need to see clearly. This is what Peter's addressing in his second letter. In the first chapter of that letter, he recalled that day where he was with James and John and, and on the mountain and he saw Jesus transfigured um, and he makes a point about it. This is what he writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And then catch this, he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit." And you see where Peter is directing our eyes. 
And he's saying, yes, I I was with James and John. We were on the mountain. We saw Jesus transfigured. We heard the voice with our own ears. This is my beloved son. And collectively, all of us, the church, has something else to hold on to. What is it? We all have the word of God. God's word has always been about God's plan of salvation in and through his son, Jesus. And now that Jesus has come, that word has been, as Peter says, more fully confirmed. God's word clearly reveals Jesus to us. And it's the lamp that we need in our darkness until the day dawns. My point is that even though we don't see things in our world or in our lives clearly, if we see Jesus clearly, we're going to be all right. We don't have the full picture. Jesus' death and resurrection illuminates our darkness and allows us to see other things, all other things, in, in the right light. For example, when you're overcome with guilt and struggling to see how God could love you, we don't try to look for something good in ourselves or try to justify our actions, searching for scapegoats or or rationalizing behavior. Seeing Jesus on the cross shows you that God loves you and all your sin is nailed with Jesus and it dies with him. Your sin is buried deep in his wounds. He loves you and he went through hell to make you his own. For eternity. You don't have to hide or or justify yourself or rationalize. You can freely confess sin. You can freely own it, knowing that nothing can lessen his love for you or take away your salvation. When it looks like evil is always winning, or when it looks like the church is failing in her mission, or when all you see is so much pain and suffering, Well, Jesus' death and resurrection show us, well, the the way of the cross. The way of the cross through death into resurrection. And that in the end, through suffering and death, right, Jesus has overcome the world. He is victorious in his resurrection. And because he is victorious, because you've been baptized into him, you are victorious too. When you fear Uh, your chronic illness, or an upcoming surgery, or the inevitable complications of a dying body, or when you fear death itself and and everything else surrounding that, well, Jesus' resurrection sheds light in our darkness again. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Death could not hold him. The entirety of sin and sickness has been put to death in his body, and God raised his son from the dead because there's no more sin to punish. Jesus' sacrifice was accepted. The cup of wrath is empty. There's nothing left unfinished. All is reconciled. For you, who have been baptized into Jesus, there's nothing to fear. You will rise from the dead one day too. Yes, your body will return to the dust, but God raises the dead. I could go on and on. Right? Seeing Jesus clearly allows us to see what we don't, uh, that we don't need to see everything clearly in this life. Because even though we don't see things in this world or in our lives clearly, if we see Jesus clearly, his life, his death, his resurrection for us, we're going to be all right. We'll get through to that day. We have what we need. Know, therefore, that God has pulled back the curtain for you, too. He has revealed his Son, Jesus, to you through his word, to which we would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. We don't have the full picture, and and so many days feel like a big, cloudy, hazy mess. And they're scary days, too. But we have what we need. Look to Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection for you. God's plan of salvation in and through his son. Listen to him. 
Trust him. He will bring you through the darkness now into the dawn of the new day of eternal life with him. Thanks be to God in Jesus' name. Amen. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend all who are in need, praying for them at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares. And help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My dear friends, please know that you are at peace with God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It is finished. At this time, friends, we would be taking our offering. And right now, there are two good ways to give your offering to St. John's. The first is to go to our website, stjohns-wp.org, S-T-J-O-H-N-S-W-P.org. And click on the Give tab. There you'll see an option for online giving. You can give a one-time offering that way, or you can sign up for an account and give a recurring offering. Another way is to send your check to the building. We are St. John's Lutheran Church, 47 Winthrop Street, Williston Park, New York, 11596. 
And let me thank you for the continued support of the Word and Sacrament ministry of this place to this community um, and to surrounding communities as well. And if you have any prayer requests, I'll send you back to our website, stjohns-wp.org, and click on the Resources tab. The second option there is Prayer Request, and there you'll see an online option uh, for you to fill out a uh, form, and you can choose to make that prayer request public. Below the form, there is a public prayer chain. This is an excellent way for us to be praying for one another. So let us know how we can be praying for you. Thank you. This week with Ash Wednesday, we begin our observance of Lent. To highlight the penitential nature of the season, it is the church's custom to suspend the use of the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. A tradition has been in place since the 5th century not to use the joyful word Alleluia in worship from the conclusion of worship on the final Sunday before Lent, which is today, until the first service on Easter Sunday. The text of our closing hymn, Alleluia, Song of Gladness, dates back to the 11th century and links us to a millennium of God's people at worship. We now repeat words from the book of Ecclesiastes, which reminds us that there are appropriate times for all things, including a time to keep silence, which we will observe regarding use of the Alleluia throughout Lent. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. As part of our observance of a holy Lent as it begins this week, we now say farewell to Alleluia during the time of our rejoicing anew at the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Day. Alleluia. Amen. As we receive the blessing of our Lord, we place our hands out in front of us like a cup to remind us that everything we have is a gift of God. We come with nothing to give, nothing to offer, and everything to receive. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. We continue with our closing hymn, Alleluia, Song of Gladness. Mm -hmm.